Heavenly Father, you are our glorious Lord and King. You are creator of all that we can see, Lord, and even what we can't see. Blessed are you. Thank you, Lord, for this day and a reminder that things are changing. The seasons are changing. You blew in fall this week, Lord. Thank you for reminding me, for reminding us that we can't control not the wind, nor the rain, nor the rising or setting of the sun. There are so many things in this world that are simply beyond our control. All was wonderfully arranged by you long ago. Sometimes it is good to remember, to realize what our inabilities are, our smallness, our creatureliness. Lord, that even locusts could devastate us, that, the, that there are things in life that we simply need to turn to you and remember that you are the one that holds the answers. You are the one that knows the other part of the story that we simply can't see from our vantage point. But Lord, sometimes we get a little busy. We talked about that in our, our, our coffee and conversations today, that we get busy. There's work to be done. There's cooking. There's cleaning. There's running here and there. There's people we must talk to, places we must go. There's, there's jobs, Lord, that are busy and important jobs that need us and need all of our mind. Lord, even Halloween, it's a little week, a week away, but we get very busy getting ready. It's another one of our special times that we have fun, and we're planning that. The elections are coming. They've really distracted us, Lord. I, I don't even want to look at Facebook anymore. There's so much that I'm tired of reading and seeing in the newspapers. Lord, there is so much. And then we, if we let our mind go, we know that Thanksgiving and Christmas are right after that. Oh, Lord, we need your help to stop. We need to rest. We need to listen like the people that we're going to hear about soon from Scripture, and to look to you again and ask, what of all this stuff is your will? Where is your kingdom in all this, Lord? Where would you have us be today? What do you want us to say? And what do you have to say to us? Lord, would, I know that you will, if we would but let you help us make time, because time doesn't just happen. We have to look for it. We have to make it. We have to set it aside to sit in your presence and enjoy you and let the reality of your love that we see in Jesus be real to us in those moments, to be to allow us to rest in that love and to realize that all the other doesn't matter if we haven't rested, if we haven't dwelt in you. Lord, we lift the many lists that's on our announcements today, Lord. We're going to lift those in silence. And we're going to lift those names that come to us that maybe aren't on the list to you. I'll leave a little space for us to lift those to you. Thank you, Lord, for being with each one, each that needs your touch, your blessing, your healing grace, your mercy. We pray all this, Lord Jesus, in your name as we pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing together verse 1 and 4 of Amazing Grace. Lord, this is your word. Let your word be not mine that's spoken, but what you would have us hear, what you would say to us this day, Lord God. That is what we look forward to. Amen. Dreams figure into our scripture lesson for today, and dreams are very uh, I would say a hot topic, but that's the name of a store. But they're very current. Let's put it that way. If you search dreams, just put that in there. Oh, my goodness. The Google goes crazy. There is all these organizations that will help your dream come true. There are songs about dreams. There are books about dreams. Um, how to realize your dream and how to figure out what you dreamt last night. It is, um, I, I don't know, it seems to be very... Um, uh, part of our culture right now. In our, and, 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 if you, and if you watch enough TV or movies, then you may be lulled into believing that our lives can be like a dream where the storybook prince and princess live and love happily ever after, and everything will be perfect. But reality often looks a bit different than what we see in the storybook romances or the 30-minute shows where everything turns out fine. We may not see the dream exactly as it's portrayed, at least not in our own lives or lives of others. So today in our scripture, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Prophet Joel is going to tell us a story about what it might seem like, or it may seem like a dream come true. Um, it begins, though, with the horror of locusts and the devastation, but it leads to repentance and restoration and the wonderful gift of prophecy, vision, and dreams. So let's hear what Joel has to say today. We were in Joel 2, and that's the little book, if you want to follow along, that lives between Hosea and Amos. It is not a very, uh, it's easy to flip past it. Verse 20, we're going to start at verse 23. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain, as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. 
even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there'll be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is the word of the Lord. This passage is quite a picture. It kind of goes rail to rail. It's only part of the story, of course, because we didn't read the first chapter and a half. But in this picture, you, get, you go from desolation to delightful. You go from empty to overflowing, fearful to praise, and shamed to glorious. Um, in all of Scripture, if you look at the entire and in the book of Joel, I'm a bit inclined to see God as having a romantic streak. Now, maybe that seems kind of crazy, but I mean it in the best sense of the word. Because if you look up the word romantic, as we would use it in in our dictionary, it means love between two people, someone who thinks of love or thinks about love and doing and saying things to show love to someone. And now you might think I've gone off the deep end, but there are numerous scriptures in, in the Bible that talk about God and Israel, and refer to Israel as, or Judah, as God's wife, as God's lover, as God's bride, and God's wife gone astray. Even Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom who has the bride. Now, you can't get much more romantic than that, a bride and a bridegroom. I mean, that's like all about romance. So, and later scripture suggests that the church is indeed the bride. Some have called the Bible the greatest love story ever told. So, humor me here, but when I was looking at the overall picture, God's ultimate plan or ultimate dream, because we are talking about dreams today, has been envisioning a way of life where God's story and our story come together. And if we look from Genesis to Revelation, in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, God and Adam and Eve are all there together. There's plenty of food. The weather's good. And there's the tree of life all ready for them in the center of the garden. Revelation, there's no more tears because the separation's over. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And and all those who've been washed, those who are new in Christ, are there with God. They can eat of the tree of life, live with God forever. God's great dream has come true. The book of Joel, then, is a rather small, almost mysterious little book. It's just squeezed in there in the middle of the the minor prophets. It was written sometime between the 8th and the 4th century, but the commentary writers now are kind of favoring the 4th century before Christ. And it begins with this army. It's not, it's a very unusual army, an army of locusts. Not a very pretty picture. The, the, the army of locusts comes and it destroys everything or is in the process of it when Joel writes to the people. And, and, uh, and it is sort of a warning or a judgment. And it, God then tells Joel to urge them to come on, tell everybody to turn back. He, want, he tells everybody, the baby and the bride and the bridegroom are particularly named are to return to the Lord, to repent and to seek God. Now, we, the part we read was the outcome God did take away the locusts and gave them everything back, the land, the grain, the wine, the oil. Everything's good again. Life is renewed. Everybody's happy. The land's happy. The animals are happy. And the people are happy. And that would be wonderful all by itself, wouldn't it? You'd be like, okay, good day. Life's better again. Then God says there's more. God promises not only restoration of the land and their livelihoods, but their spiritual lives will be restored. God promises God's dreams and visions and a prophetic word. He said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, everybody, sons and daughters and old and young and male and female slaves. Now, you mind might have jumped somewhere when you heard that scripture, if you're familiar with the book of Acts at all. Because in Acts 1, Peter says those exact words 
after the, um, after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. But then Joel goes on and he gives another promise. And we may not like this promise so much. He says, we're going to see portents, signs, and wonders before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Those apocalyptic words make us go, huh? Let me hear that again. There's going to be blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Well, I began to wonder, how does that fit in the dream? <laughs> that sounds more like a bad nightmare to me, not a dream. But if we look closer, we see that there is some good news there. The fateful, of the day, fateful day of the Lord won't come without warning. That's what all those are. Those are signs and warnings. They're to get you ready. And that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, and it says also after that, some people will escape. And that God will call them. God will call them and take care of them. But what does that have to do with today? You are sitting there wondering, that was Joel. We are now. What are, where are we today? Do we have to just sit here and get ready for the great and terrible day of the Lord? Is that our job? No, I think our job is to receive the dreams, the visions, and the prophetic words meant for us. That, that if you notice in Scripture, God has always had some dreams and some visions and prophetic word. And, and it doesn't say that it's just for pastors and religious leaders. That's the Old Testament style. You know, the prophets and the kings and some special people got to hear God's word, but nobody else. Oh, it's not true anymore. In the New Testament, God was sending his spirit out to everyone. That's why it, everyone gets to be a part of the action, if you will. The old men, the young men. The, the women and the sons. So then you have to wonder why women aren't allowed to preach. But we won't do that this morning. We won't go there. That one just, that's a bunny trail. We won't go there this morning. Because they're going to have, they're going to speak prophecy. So where do you and I fit in that list? Have you found yourself in that list this morning? Because it seems like nobody's being left out. God let loose the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And God is still giving his spirit to those who believe, giving his visions, his prophetic words, and his dreams today. God has not stopped being God, and God is still looking towards that day when the world's going to experience all the blessings that Joel talked about. There will be plenty. There will be joy. Everybody will be doing well where there's enough for everyone, and they will call on the name of the Lord before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, what about Jaredstown Presbyterian Church? Let's get a little bit more specific. I realized, you know, as I thought about that, I thought about dreams and visions. I thought, you know what? Jaredstown's had some dreams and visions of their own. And I started thinking about that because there's, there was a dream, there was a vision, whichever one you want to call it, that, there were, that people in the community that didn't have much to eat would have a place to come eat. And so there was once a month a dinner planned where people could sit around tables and enjoy food and fellowship. And then, and then I realized somebody else had another kind of dream or vision that, that if a little angel or a little dove was hanging on the wall of a child's hospital room, well, they would maybe be comforted by that because it might bring them a reminder that someone was watching over them, someone maybe they'd learn to know as God. And then there is another little dream or vision that children should learn lessons about Jesus and God and parts of the Bible and then take stories home in a bag. And maybe another had the thought that, well, we should do that, uh, something for children. We should do other things once a month for children in our congregation and outside our congregation. And the, a, a couple weeks ago, we all gathered for something I strangely named called Munchies at the Manse, but we had a great time. And I asked people what they thought God's dream was for Jaredstown, because I'm, I'm asking that because I know the dream receivers are all of you. I'm just the dream helper to put things into place. And, and many people said, what people have often said since I've been here is that they sure hoped there would be more children and families that would come to this church. And that more people would find their way. I was at a conference this past week. And so this was going around in my head. And he said, 
this speaker, uh, Carl Vaders was his name, he said, getting bigger is not a plan or a vision for a small church. <laughs> so, uh-oh, <laughs> that's not our plan? He said, God can use all sizes of churches for God's glory. The size doesn't matter. God's spirit is not limited by the number of people that either fill or don't fill these pews. The disciples started out as a church of 12, if you'll remember. But if you look at that first chapter in Acts, it said their size had already increased to 120 by that time. They were 120 strong. But size doesn't matter to God. It's what the church does that matters to God. Just before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, right before that verse where Peter, where Peter repeats Joel, it says that they were gathered they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, Acts 1.14. After the Holy Spirit was poured out then, they'd been devoting themselves to prayer. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And then the, the Jews that were there that were foreign Jews, they were for, uh, from other countries, well, they heard in their own language the prophetic words of those disciples. They heard them telling, you know what the prophetic word was? God's deeds of power. That's what they were saying. I think sometimes we think that the prophetic word is going to be something we don't know anything about. Oh, how could I say the prophetic word? It was all about what God had done, what God's deeds of power were. That's what they said. These were ordinary people. The disciples were tax collectors. Do you remember? They were fishermen. They were zealots. They were ordinary people, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, they were able to tell what God had done. And those who heard these deeds, they heard about these deeds in their own language, goes, well, what does this mean? Aha. Uh -huh. And that was, when, that was the cue for Peter and the other 11 disciples to stand up, and they then told the whole story about Jesus. They told what God had done in more detail and invited them to be a part of it too. They could come be baptized, and they could have some Holy Spirit, just like they, the disciples had. Well, if you know the end of the story, 3,000 were baptized that day. But it's not about the number. It's about what happened after that. At Acts 2.42 reads, Then that group of people, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, to breaking of the bread, which is the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. It seems to me that the proper stance for anyone, and that includes you and me, who wants to know what God wants us to do, who is waiting for a sign from God, who is, who is hoping the Holy Spirit will speak up, needs to be devoted to prayer, to study God's word, to be in fellowship, and to be at the Lord's Supper. Our devotion to God in Christ is how the Spirit can speak to us. Because we who have been baptized already have the Holy Spirit. You already have it. If you've been baptized, you're guaranteed the Holy Spirit. It says so in Scripture. But we may not have been listening. We may not have spent as much time being devoted. So I looked up the word devoted because that one was really getting to me. What does devoted mean? And the Greek word is prokerterio. Yeah. That's the Greek word. Don't he's going to say that one three times fast. And it means to persevere, to be persistent, to be constant in our efforts of prayer, of listening, having our eyes, being willing to have our eyes open to see God's vision, God's dream, or to hear the prophetic word. Well, I imagine you may be getting a not-so-subtle hint that the church is here to serve God's dream. That's why we're here. We're here to hear or or see God's dream, or to speak God's dream, and that the word God wants people to know is how very much God has done in love for them. God wants them to live with God. So if you're going to live with somebody, you got to get to know them, right? You can't just go live with someone you don't know because you know, I don't know about you. I don't trust you. So we have to invite people to know God so that they would want someday to live with God forever. Because God is a dreamer, and God is romantic. He's romantic with his God's eyes open. God knows how we are, as Calvin would say, our depravity. But yet God and God's great love sent his son to show us again and again and most completely on the cross how far God will go 
to reach us, to love us, to live with and to live within us through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Let's devote a few minutes to prayer. Would you pray with me? God, you're amazing. And you would have us be the people with your dreams, that you would share your dream with us, that you would share your visions with us, and you would share a word for other people with us. Lord God, you could use anyone. Why would you use us? I thank you that you care about us and you care about all those other folks that maybe don't know who you are yet. I thank you that you want us to be devoted and that you will help us know what that means for each of us and you will help us learn bit by bit how much we can trust you and how much you would like to entrust to us, especially the name of your son Jesus and who he is. I bless you, Lord God, and I thank you for your grace. In your name we do pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you join me in our affirmation of faith? I will ask the question and you will give the answer. What is the chief and highest end of man? Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn. Every time I feel the Spirit, it is number 66. Well, uh, there are still cards, little little note cards, uh, bookmarks that remind you to keep your journal of gratitude, to keep praying Thanksgiving. So if you haven't got yours, pick it up and join us as we learn what giving thanks can do to our hearts and our lives. And we learn, we give thanks today maybe as my best response to that sermon, that God loves us so much that he doesn't send locusts anymore. He sent Jesus. And maybe his spirit will remind us that week as we go about our work, our rest, our play. In the name of our glorious Father, beloved Son, and Holy Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Amen.